world we live in is awash with data that comes pouring in from everywhere around us. On its own, this data is just noise and confusion. To make sense of data, to find the meaning in it, we need the powerful branch of science, statistics. Believe me, there's nothing boring about statistics, especially not today when we can make the data sing. With statistics, we can really make sense of the world. And there is more. With statistics, the data deluge, as it's being called, is leading us to an ever greater understanding of life on Earth and the universe beyond. And thanks to the incredible power of today's computers, it may fundamentally transform the process of scientific discovery. I kid you not, Statistics is now the sexiest subject around. Did you know that there is one million boats in Sweden? That's one boat per nine people. It's the highest number of boats per person in Europe. Being a statistician, you don't like telling your profession at dinner parties. But really, statisticians shouldn't be shy because everyone wants to understand what's going on. And statistics gives us a perspective on the world we live in that we can't get in any other way. Statistics tells us whether the things we think and believe are actually true. Statistics are far more useful than we usually like to admit. In the last recession, there was this famous call in to a talk radio station. The man complained, in times like this, when unemployment rates are up to 13% and income has fallen by 5% and suicide rates are climbing, I get so angry that the government is wasting money on things like collection of statistics. I'm not officially a statistician. Strictly speaking, my field is global health. But I got really obsessed with stats when I realized how much people in Sweden just don't know about the rest of the world. I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. These students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pretest when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. <laughs> but one late night when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. I did also an unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine, and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> Today, there's more information accessible than ever before. And I work with my team at the Gapminder Foundation using new tools that help everyone make sense of the changing world. We draw on the masses of data that's now freely available from international institutions like the UN and the World Bank. And it's become my mission to share the insights from this data with anyone who listens and to reveal how statistics is nothing to be frightened of. 
I'm going to provide you a view of the global health situation across mankind. And I'm going to do that in a hopefully enjoyable way, so relax. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. This is uh, China, and this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And I'm going to stage a race here between this sort of yellowish Ford here and the red Toyota down there and the brownish Volvo. Huh? <laughs> the Toyota has a very bad start down here and United States Ford is going off road there and the Volvo is doing quite fine. This is the war. The Toyota got off track and now Toyota is coming on the healthier side of Sweden. That's about where I sold the Volvo and bought the Toyota. And... <laughs> This was a great leap forward when China fell down. It was central planning by Mao Zedong. China recovered and they said never more stupid central planning, but they went up here. No, there was one more inequity. Look there, United States. Oh, they broke my frame. Washington DC is so rich over there, but they are not as healthy as Kerala in India. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Welcome to the USA, world leaders in big cars and free data. There are many here who share my vision of making public data accessible and useful for everyone. The city of San Francisco is in the lead, opening up its data on everything. Even the police department is releasing all its crime reports. This official crime data has been turned into a wonderful interactive map by two of the city's computer wizards. It's community statistics in action. Crime spotting is a map of crime reports from the San Francisco Police Department uh, showing, you know, dots on maps uh, for citizens to be able to see patterns of crime around their neighborhoods in San Francisco. The map is not just about individual crimes, but about broader patterns that show you where crime is clustered around the city, which areas have high crime and which areas have relatively low crime. We are here at the top of Jones Street on Knob Hill. Quite a nice neighborhood. What the crime maps show us is the relationship between topography and crime. Basically, the higher up the hill, the less crime there is. We cross over the border into the flats. Essentially, as soon as you get into the kind of lower lying areas of Jones Street, the crime just skyrockets. Here in the Uptown Tenderloin District. It's one of the oldest and densest neighborhoods in San Francisco. This is where you go to buy drugs, uh, right around here. You see lots of uh, aggravated assaults, lots of auto thefts. Basically, the huge part of the, of the crime that happens in the, in the city happens just right in this five or six block radius. If you've been hearing police sirens in your neighborhood, you can use the map to find out why. If you're out at night in an unfamiliar part of town, you can check the map for streets to avoid. If a neighbor gets burgled, you can see, is it a one-off or has there been a spike in local crime? If you commute through a neighborhood and you're worried about its safety, the fact that we have the ability to turn off all the nighttime and middle of the day crimes and show you just the things that are happening during the commute is a statistical operation. But I think to people that are interacting with the thing, it feels very much more like they're just sort of browsing a website or you know, shopping on Amazon. They're, they're looking at data and they don't realize they're doing statistics. What's most exciting for me is that public statistics is making citizens more powerful and the authorities more accountable.
we have community meetings that the police attend. And what citizens are now doing are bringing printouts of the maps that show where crimes are taking place and they're demanding services from the police department and the police department is now having to change how they police, how they provide policing services because the data is showing what is working and what is not. People in San Francisco are also using public data to map social inequalities and see how to improve society and the possibilities are endless. I think our dream government data analysis project would really be focused on live information, on stuff that was being reported and pushed out to the world over the internet as it was happening. You know, trash pickups, traffic accidents, buses, and I think through the kind of stats gathering power of the internet, it's possible to really begin to see the, the workings of the city displayed as a unified interface. So that's where we are heading towards a world of free data with all the statistical insights that come from it, accessible to everyone, empowering us as citizens and letting us hold our rulers to account. It's a long way from where statistics began. Statistics are essential to us to monitor our governments and our societies. But it was our rulers up there who started the collection of statistics in the first place in order to monitor us. In fact, the word statistics comes from the state. Modern statistics began two centuries ago. Once it got going, it spread and never stopped. And guess who was first? The Chinese have Confucius, the Italians have Da Vinci, and the British have Shakespeare, and we have the Tabellwerket, the first ever systematic collection of statistics. Since the year 1749, we have collected data on every birth, marriage, and death, and we are proud of it. The Tabellverket recorded information from every parish in Sweden. It was a huge quantity of data, and it was the first time any government could get an accurate picture of its people. Sweden had been the greatest military power in Northern Europe, but by 1749 our star was really fading and other countries were growing stronger. At least, though, we were a large power, thought to have 20 million people, enough to rival Britain and France. But we were in for a nasty surprise. The first analysis of Tabellverket revealed that Sweden only had 2 million inhabitants. Sweden was not only a power in decline, it also had a very small population. The government was horrified by this finding. What if the enemy found out? But the Tabellverket also showed that many women died in childbirth and many children died young. So government took action to improve the health of the people. This was the beginning of modern Sweden. It took more than 50 years before the Austrians, Belgians, Danes, Dutch, French, Germans, Italians, and finally the British caught up with Sweden in collecting and using statistics. It was called political arithmetic. That was a lovely phrase that was used for statistics. Governments could have much more control and understanding of, of this society, how it was working, how it was developing, and essentially so they could control it better. It wasn't just governments who woke up to the power of statistics. Right across Europe, 19th century society went mad for facts. And despite its late start, Britain, with its Royal Statistical Society in London, 
was soon a statistician's nirvana. I love looking at old copies of the Royal Statistical Society Journal because it's full up with such odd stuff. There's a, a wonderful paper from the 1840s which shows a map of England and the rates of bastardy in each county. And so you can identify very quickly the areas with high rates of bastardy. Being in East Anglia, it always makes me slightly laugh that Norfolk seems to top the bastardy league in the 1840s. One of the founders of the Royal Statistical Society was the great Victorian mathematician and inventor, Charles Babbage. In 1842, he read the latest poem by an equally great Victorian, Alfred Tennyson. Vision of Sin contained the lines, Fill the cup and fill the can, have a rouse before the morn. Every moment dies a man, every moment one is born. So keen a statistician was Babbage that he could not contain himself. He dashed off a letter to Tennyson explaining that because of population growth, the line should read, Every moment dies a man and one and a sixteenth is born. I may add that the exact figure is 1.067, but something must be conceded to the laws of meter. In the 19th century, scholars all over Europe did amazing work in measuring their societies. They were hoovering up data on almost everything. But numbers alone don't tell you anything. You have to analyze them. And that's what makes statistics. <laughs> 